Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining our Seclair uh, podcast every Monday. Uh, my name is Caitlin Angeletti, and I'm one of the physician assistants here at Seclair. And joining me today is Jim Ellermeyer. I'm one of the behavioral health therapists here at Seclair. There's only two of us today, but um, we're talking about a really important uh, subject um, regarding sleep. So today we're going to discuss a little bit about sleep hygiene and, you know, kind of what is sleep and what we can do to make our sleep you know, better and more restful. Um, so, you know, I think the best way to kind of start this topic off is just by describing what, how sleep works in the body and how our brains, you know, m make us fall asleep by the time the night comes. Um, so melatonin is the biggest, most important chemical that's released in our brain um, for sleep hygiene. And melatonin um, is actually released by the pineal gland in the brain, and it helps to regulate our sleep habits so that we actually know when to fall asleep when it gets dark out at night, and then kind of decreases over the night's time and then wakes us up in the morning um, when it becomes light out. And there's a lot of things that we can do as far as um, external environment and our behavior that we can actually adjust our melatonin secretion so that it is released and kind of navigates its way through our system in a healthy manner um, to kind of help promote restful sleep. Um, I think something that's really interesting and important about melatonin is that a lot of us might not be aware of this, but um, serotonin is actually a very vital part of melatonin as well. Um, if there's not enough serotonin in the body, the melatonin is also likely to be decreased and I think, you know, with a lot of the things that we go over as far as, you know, depression and other mood difficulties, you know, serotonin is a word we use a lot um, as far as its importance of our mood and kind of using these two things to recognize that melatonin and serotonin are so closely related that if you are having mood difficulties and, you know, noticing that serotonin isn't very good, the chances of your sleep are probably are, you know, going to be pretty limited as well. Well, one of the first issues that I raise with people when they come in is, how are you sleeping? And 90% of them at least will say, not well. And sleep affects over, absolute overall wellness of, of your body. Tell me how you feel, Caitlin, when you're really tired. Um, when I'm really tired, I would say I have difficulty focusing and I'm moody and I just tend to not have a very good day as opposed to a night that I have a very restful night of sleep. So you're not a real happy girl. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> um, and I think that's a really important thing to bring up too because, you know, so many times in kind of the list of symptoms when people first present um, for a mood difficulty, you know, they'll say, I'm, I've been frequently agitated, and then, you know, all these symptoms will be coming up that they've been anxious, agitated, you know, very irritable. Um, and then as kind of further into the discussion, we talk about that they haven't been sleeping well. And a lot of these symptoms may not be because of a mood difficulty, but maybe because they're lacking some sleep and kind of going back to the basics and recognizing that our bodies just don't function well when we're not sleeping well. Um, so it just it's a really vital vital part of our entire well-being. And what we keep get bombarded with by pharmacology companies, uh, everything, that a pill will solve all your problems. Take a pill and go to sleep. Uh, tell me what you tell me what your thoughts are on that, Kayla. Yeah, so Ambien is one that's commonly used. Um, most prescribers, you know, will use Ambien, say, oh, you're not sleeping well, here's this pill, and go ahead and, you know, try this to go to sleep. And, you know, oftentimes it, it does work, but the problem with, taking medications such as Ambien, is that our bodies become so dependent on that pill to fall asleep that it's, it actually, I feel that it dysregulates our sleep even further because if we're already having sleeping difficulties, we get so dependent on something that we can't even sleep without it. Ultimately, that underlying issue has never really been solved. And there's a lot of things that we can do just from our environment and our behavior that actually can help promote a good restful night of sleep. And so I think that's the first and foremost thing to kind of think about when you realize that you're not sleeping well or what, you know, just kind of take into consideration all the things that you're doing before bed or, you know, around bedtime. Um, what, what, what recommendations sure. do you have? Oh, absolutely. One of the things that we generally go over with folks and, and help them educate them on, and believe me, we include ourselves in everything here, is sleep hygiene. Sleep hygiene. You, you spoke of melatonin earlier, and you explained that melatonin helps us regulate between light and darkness. We're hardwired 
that when it's light to be awake and when it's dark to be asleep. One of the things I ask people is, how much TV do you watch in an, in an evening? Uh, how much or how far much are you in front of a computer screen? And we don't understand that those things are giving us light. And it's confusing, or we're confusing our brains with all that light. Uh, one of the things that, one of the, you go to a sleep doctor. One of the first questions he'll ask you is, do you have a TV in your bedroom? How many people have you seen that say, I can't get to sleep without the TV on? Oh, I used to be, I used to be like that, actually, until I kind of recognized that I was having some trouble sleeping. I used to always watch TV, and I would fall asleep watching TV. And I just kind of thought that that was... I never really saw any harm in that, um, and now I'm coming to learn, just kind of as doing all these different, you know, podcasts and research and just these other things about sleep and kind of from an educational standpoint that when we lay our bodies to go down to sleep, you know, it's dark room and all of that stuff, and we're trying to kind of shut our brain off from the day, which is, I think, challenging enough for most people, you know, the day is just so full of activity and things going on that, you know, it's hard to just kind of lay your head to the pillow and not think about anything, but to even make that even further challenging to fall asleep, we'll have a TV on. So despite our attempt to kind of wind down and fall asleep and close our eyes, our brain is picking up all of the, even if we're not watching the TV, we're listening to it, our brain is immediately focused on the noise that's coming from the television, that it's, it's confused. So, you know, you're trying to put everything to bed, but really you're actually further stimulating the brain to be awake and be conscious of, you know, the other things that are going on in the room. Tell me about people, I'm sure you've heard people, and I have heard them too, that say, I like to have a couple drinks at night, alcohol, help me relax before I go to sleep. Tell me how that affects you. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, for some people that does work. You know, people say, I have a glass of wine, and that, you know, knocks me right out. But if you're having sleep difficulties, these are, again, these things to consider that it could be any of the following factors. So, you know, TV, drinking alcoholic beverages mm -hmm. before bed. Um, and the reason that, you know, everyone kind of this kind of general knowledge, but that alcohol is, you know, considered a depressant to the system. But what we do forget is that alcohol is such a high sugar content that it's kind of like, you know, when you tell your kid you're not allowed to have any candy after six o'clock at night because they'll stay awake and they have all this sugar going out through their blood that it's difficult to fall asleep. Well, alcohol is kind of like that adult, no, you know, adult candy before bed type of thing because when we're drinking wine or beer or liquor or whatever the case is, um, it's just such high sugar content that when our body's processing all of that, it's processing a good amount of glucose. And so it's difficult for our bodies to fall down and have restful sleep when we're trying to process all this sugar through our systems. Here at Seclair, we generally recommend, and we'll go through an evening and ask a person to write down everything that they do in a particular evening every night for a week before they go to bed. And then we'll look at that, and we'll look at some things that may be, may be causing some restlessness. And one of them would be, we generally suggest, is have some maybe 45 minutes, half an hour of quiet time before going to bed. Uh, a whole lot of people will watch three hours of TV, then watch the news, which I do not recommend, and then go to sleep and one, lay in bed and wonder, toss and turn and wonder why I can't get to sleep. And... How about how about eating a a lot? Many people eat later in the evening. Tell tell me about that. Yeah, and it, that could, basically goes on the same um, concept of when you're drinking alcohol right before bed. It's when we're again trying to kind of settle or settle ourselves down for the day. We have this big meal and then fall asleep. And I'm certainly guilty of this as well. By the time I get home and just do other things, you know, it might be nine o'clock before I actually sit down and eat a meal. And you know, I constantly have to remind myself to try and eat earlier in the day because, again, our body is actually wakening up and by processing all of the food that it's not, you know, finding finding rest in that because we're our metabolism, we just boosted our metabolism by eating. And, you know, that's just something to kind of keep in mind. And, you know, like I said, I it's a lot easier for us to just say this than to actually perform it. And I definitely have to, you know, remind myself on a regular basis to try and eat earlier in the nighttime um, because, you know, it's it's – it's harder to fall asleep when you're eating later. And again, that works the same way for exercise. Of course, we always promote exercise, and it's all there's the benefits are just, you know, few and you know, just very strong. Of course, we all know that. But exercising again helps to awaken the system and stimulate the system and boost the metabolism. And so when you're doing something like that right before you go to bed, chances of having difficulty falling asleep are pretty high. Um, so you know, trying to not exercise within an hour or two of, of 
before going to bed is really, you know, a good recommendation as well. And if you're, the stomach doesn't sleep. So when you take a larger meal in the evening, like you said, the stomach's working. And for the stomach to work, it requires your brain to be active also. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that people do is they, they, they talk about racing thoughts or they uh, toss and turn in bed. And one of the methods that we hear at Seclair, and I know you've participated in it, Caitlin, is mindfulness-based stress reduction. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this is, I think, for me personally, where I find the most benefit from mindfulness. Um, you know, sometimes it's difficult during my day to remember to do things mindfully. But um, if, any of, uh, if any of you watching have ever come to one of our groups and, you know, done the mindfulness at the beginning of group, I bet eight out of, eight out of ten of you, you know, will say that they've kind of felt a sedative effect from, from mindfulness activity, you know, just kind of sitting there and being with yourself and focusing on your breathing. And, you know, a lot of people, you know, we've had people even fall asleep during mindfulness and things like that. And that's kind of where I use mindfulness most beneficially in my life, you know, right before I'm trying to fall asleep and I'm already just thinking about what, you know, what happened during the day or what's going on the next day, which I think everybody's guilty of doing, you know, um, I just sit there and try to remember to just focus on my breathing and just take big, deep breaths and in and out. And eventually you really do fall asleep just as you would feel that kind of relaxation feeling when you're in group. Um, and you can really kind of use that to your advantage by using mindfulness activities before bed. And to wrap it up, of course, there are medical conditions, serious medical conditions that can only be diagnosed and treated by a basically a sleep doctor. And uh, one of them was, at one time in my life, I had this. I had sleep apnea. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so sleep apnea is a really common problem, especially um, in, in obese patients as well, but it can also be um, a muscular, muscular challenge. Uh, so with sleep apnea, basically the, the muscles surrounding your mouth and throat area um, become really relaxed during sleep, and they actually collapse on the airway. So it stops you from sleeping and actually manifests itself in really loud snoring. Um, and sometimes even if you're with a spouse or something, they'll notice that you even stop breathing through, throughout your night of sleep. And that's really um, kind of how sleep apnea is diagnosed. And you'll have to do a sleep study and, you know, they kind of assess how many times you stop breathing and um, throughout the night and, you know, snoring level and things like that. Um, but it, it is a very common problem and it can cause you to actually be even more tired throughout the day because you're not getting restful sleep. You're not allowing enough oxygen to kind of get into your system throughout your night of sleep. So you'll actually find yourself falling asleep in the middle of the day or you could even have a cup of coffee and then find yourself being really, really tired. So these are all things to keep in mind. Um, you know, if you're kind of questioning if you have sleeping difficulties, you know, what are you noticing? Kind of reassess yourself before you go to bed and, you know, be more mindful when you're exercising and eating dinner to not do it, you know, right before bedtime. And if you're still kind of putting all of these sleep hygiene pieces of the puzzle together and you feel like you're doing a really, you know, sound job with it, then there's other things to consider like sleep apnea and other things like that. And you should definitely go, you know, get checked out by a doctor if you feel that your sleep habits have been, you know, really consistent. Well, I've noticed uh, sitting in with you, obviously you deal with people with a lot of fatigue issues, as, as do I, and I've never seen you uh, prescribe five-hour energy to anyone. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> five-hour energy is one way to look at it, but... <laughs> <laughs> never seen you prescribe it. Yeah. <laughs> Promoting sleep, Jim, you know. <laughs> um, so thanks again for joining us today. Uh, if you'd like to find out more, you can go to seclair.com or subscribe to the Seclair video on YouTube for more videos. Also follow us on Google Plus and join us live on Mondays around noontime uh, so you can ask your questions for us to answer during our discussions. And happy St. Patrick's Day. <laughs>